We're starting. We're recording. Great. This is Criteria. This is Criteria. This is Criteria. Hey there, everyone. My name is James Majewski. And these are my criteria. <laughs> and that would be Thomas Miris, everyone. And this is the latest <laughs> podcast produced by CatholicCulture.org. Thomas, what show do you host again? I host the Catholic Culture Podcast. And James Majewski, what show do you host? I am the voice on Catholic Culture Audiobooks. And we've decided to bring our efforts together to bring you a brand new show, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast. Am I missing anything, Thomas? No. Okay. Well, so Thomas and I both live in New York City, as some of you may know. And as some of you may also know, it looks like we're going to be heading into a third month of citywide lockdown and social distancing. So with no obvious end in sight, we thought... What better time to start a film podcast? Yes. And for those of you who in two years have forgotten about this entire situation <laughs> that we're in right now, we're in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. Yes. So this film podcast is something that I've been thinking about doing for a while, but it seems like a good time to start. So people do have extra time at home, hopefully not because you're unemployed or anything like that, but a good time to bone up on your classic movies. So the basic concept for Criteria is this is a show in which every two weeks or so we explore a film of real artistic merit that will be of interest to Catholics. So uh, you'll notice I'm not saying they're Catholic films necessarily per se or they're religious films, although there will be plenty of those as we'll get into but yes, basically the the goal is to get a uh, discussion going about these great films and and get people watching some of them, you know, venturing outside of sort of the pop culture of what's happening now and into some things that have stood the test of time. Right. Hopefully the conversation ends up being more than just what are some of the Christian themes in the latest Marvel and or Disney movie. I don't know. Are those both the same thing now, Marvel and Disney? Yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, I, I wouldn't know, James. I really I don't pay attention to these <laughs> things. I promise. So anyway, equal to that is the discussion itself. It's not not only getting people to watch these movies, but hopefully, it, first of all, improving ourselves as film viewers and our ability to have conversations about these things. And and encouraging others to do the same, because I think it's important to not just sort of passively consume movies. That's something that I do a lot, even when I watch great films. I tend not to think about them very much. Or it's not so so much about even thinking as like training your, your powers of observation. So when I've been watching films in preparation for this project that we're doing, I'm not so much trying to analyze as I'm watching, but to view with... I would describe it as having a hungry eye, like just watching more eagerly and actively and trying to sort of like take in every detail in the frame. And then later that can feed into a better discussion and, and better reflections on what I've seen later on. Right. Yeah. I mean, this really is part of Catholic culture's broader mission to spark a renewal of culture. Movies are, I think, a great training ground for developing, well, as you say, Thomas, this hungry eye, kind of flexing the muscles of what it means to be an audience or a spectator. So certainly for myself, going into this project at the outset, that's one of the things that I'm most looking forward to is this sort of concerted way to regularly kind of put myself on a training regimen for developing my eye, developing my attentiveness, my awareness when I'm watching a film. But then that crosses over into any of the media that I consume, any artistic experience that I might find myself in. I'm an actor by trade, so I love going to see the theater. I also enjoy seeing dance or going to other performances, poetry readings, and all of these 
live events kind of demand a level of presence and awareness that if you don't bring it, things so easily escape you. At least I'm speaking for myself here. I don't know about you, Thomas, uh, being the improvisational musician that you are, probably nothing gets past you. But <laughs> Hardly. So we kind of asked ourselves what might be a good springboard for this project. And as it turns out, uh, the Vatican has already provided years ago a nifty reference point for Catholics who may be interested in exploring the wider deposit of uh, worthwhile film out there. And that is none other than the Vatican film list. Thomas, you want to tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's interesting that the the title of the list actually uh, was originally just some important films, <laughs> which I like. I mean, it gives you an idea of it. It's, it's not intent, you know, well, first of all, of course, the, the Vatican, the, the church claims no you know, authority over defining sort of like what's the list of the greatest films of all time or anything like that. And and the Vatican itself is not, you know, synonymous with the church. But yeah, so so it's not really setting up a canon. It's some important films. The occasion for this list, and I owe this to an article on uh, the website of the Catholic film critic Stephen Gradonis, who gives a little bit of the history before this, behind this, because the Wikipedia article doesn't give much detail. This film list was released in 1995 in conjunction with this plenary assembly of the Pontifical Commission for Social Communications, which was addressed by Pope St. John Paul II. And that's worth noting, too, because Pope John Paul II is the patron. We, we try to have a patron for each of these podcasts that we start. And so everything is, is offered to Jesus through Mary, of course, but our particular patron saint for this podcast is Pope St. John Paul II, who was, of course, an artist, an actor, a poet, a playwright, and certainly a lover of great films. So I, I don't think that requires too much explanation, but we're asking, we're doing it in his honor and asking for his intercession. So he addressed this assembly of the Pontifical Commission for Social Communications. And that year, it was observing the 100th anniversary of the motion picture. Should I read a little bit of, of his address here? Yeah, it's a great address. There's a lot of good stuff in there. So I'm just going to going to read the part that bears on film specifically. And, you know, it's certainly similar in some of what it says to his longer, more in-depth letter to artists, which is very well known. And which you can and hear which we read also by James. Have. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> on the Catholic Culture audiobooks, if you just look for that in your podcast feed. So, just reading from the address of St. John Paul II here. This year, a significant anniversary offers elements of reflection for your plenary meeting. I refer to the centenary of cinematography. Since the first public audience in Paris viewed the moving pictures prepared by the Lumiere brothers in December 1895, the film industry has become a universal medium exercising a profound influence on the development of people's attitudes and choices, and possessing a remarkable ability to influence public opinion and culture across all social and political frontiers. The church's overall judgment of this art form as of all genuine art is positive and hopeful. We have seen that masterpieces of the art of filmmaking can be moving challenges to the human spirit, capable of dealing in depth with subjects of great meaning and importance from an ethical and spiritual point of view. Unfortunately, though, some cinema productions merit criticism and disapproval, even severe criticism and disapproval. This is the case when films distort the truth, oppress genuine freedom, or show scenes of sex and violence offensive to human dignity. It is a fallacy for filmmakers to do this in the name of free artistic expression. Freedom is an indivisible human good. It cannot be invoked to justify moral evil or absolve degrading behavior, particularly in view of the uncritical way in which most people accept the cinema's powerful and persuasive influence. In encouraging and recognizing films which strengthen and uplift the human spirit, and in discouraging the production and viewing of films which depict and appear to sanction human depravity, the church is not seeking to limit creativity, but to liberate creative talent and challenge it to pursue the highest ideals of this art form. So that's all I'll read there. But, you know, it's interesting that so often when I see references to film in papal addresses or church documents, they always seem to start out with this basic fact of the world we live in that films do in fact have this incredible power 
and influence on our culture mm. almost before addressing sort of the the inherent quality as a film as a specific art form it's always just starting with the practical reality that like this is something that has to be addressed and looked at right yeah that is remarkable because there's more than one church document on the topic i think was it pope pius the 12th who wrote on the ideal film Yes. And then, yeah, he wrote like a, a series of three addresses, I believe, directed to the representatives mm -hmm. of the Italian film industry. Um, and those are the most in-depth comments from a pope that we have on film. And they're well worth reading. I think they're they're the most, right. probably the, the most useful on the art of film in particular. Yeah, we'll probably be taking a look at those and who knows, maybe maybe throwing up an abridged version on Catholic culture audiobooks. But there was another document even before that, was it Pius the Tenth? I, I don't, don't remember. Yeah, there's a short encyclical or apostolic exhortation on film, but it, it mostly does take the form of saying, "Look, this is a very influential art form, and here are some of the dangers, and here's what you should do, and here's what you shouldn't do." On kind of a very basic moralistic level, and I, I, I'm not saying that by way of criticism, but it just doesn't get so much into the film as an art form as Pope Pius the Twelfth's document does. Right. And lest you get the impression that the church is just all about assigning warnings and precautions and directives to filmmakers, the Vatican film list, really, or some important films, as it was called, is really kind of about celebrating the breadth of work that has taken place over the 100 and I guess at the time it was 100 years, but now yes. it's been 125 years since yeah. the dawn of the motion picture. Yes. Yeah. So later in the same year, uh, after this this address was given, the Pontifical Commission put out this document, some important films. The films were chosen by a committee of 12 international movie scholars appointed by the head of the Pontifical Commission, who was Archbishop John Foley. I don't know a lot about him. I sort of Googled him a little bit and he seems like a, you know, a, a, he was a man of Orthodox faith and seems like a very well-regarded archbishop. But according to Stephen Gradanis's article here, Archbishop Foley said the list is not intended to canonize these particular films and the commission acknowledged, quote, not all that deserve mention are included. So obviously that's the case. There's only 45 films on the list. But the list consists of three categories, religion, values, and art, with 15 films in each of the three categories. But what I think is impressive about the list is the breadth, the variety that's contained in there. So you've got comedy, you've got horror, you've got science fiction and westerns. Well, I would say that the list is a great jumping off point for getting involved in classic films of a number of genres because it is so varied. It includes classic Hollywood films uh, that are they're popular and well well loved, like It's a Wonderful Life, for example, um, and also films that more people will be unlikely to have seen in foreign languages and things like that. But pretty much the vast majority of them, you could debate, you know, whether they're the best 45 ever, and that wasn't the, the intention of the list, but the vast majority of them are universally canonized classics. Even if this is not like the entire canon of great films, virtually all of them are universally well-regarded, if not viewed as among the greatest films ever made. So it's a great hook and a great jumping off point to get Catholics, not just to see some great religious films, but also just to get Catholics more acquainted with the best that film has to offer, whether it's a religious film or not. Right. And whether it is a religious film or not, I think you can be confident with each of these films that there is going to be something worthwhile to chew on, whether it is from a moral value sort of uh, perspective or a more explicitly religious perspective. Even in the art category, a lot of those films are really densely laden with moral questions and questions about existence. And while they're not necessarily all able to be endorsed by a fully Catholic conception of the world, they're, they're all certainly able to be engaged with and offer a lot to talk about. So that's what we're really hoping hoping for this podcast is that we're going to be able to have some good conversations, not just about the films from a thematic consideration, but also about 
the formal qualities of the films. What makes these good movies from a technical perspective? It's also worth mentioning that neither Thomas nor I considers ourselves a cinephile or film buff. In fact, it's important to us in this project to kind of make this really about laymen talking about movies and and digging into them in a way that perhaps too many others feel disqualified from or not able to do. I think that, you know, certainly we want film buffs and cinephiles to be a part of the conversation as well. But we're going to be having a lot of guests on the show, and these are going to be guests who are not movie critics or filmmakers themselves, although we will hopefully have some movie critics and filmmakers on as well. So the conversation is really going to be a broad one, hopefully giving a lot of space for many voices to chime in. And yeah, we're excited. Yeah, well put. And I'll just circle back to an observation you made that, you know, in the art category, not all of the films are necessarily completely Catholic in what they portray or even free from like morally questionable content. I mean, even the religion section, the very first film on the religion section, because at least it's listed alphabetically on Wikipedia, is Andrei Rublev. That that film has a scene with some nudity in it. And, you know, you could debate whether that should have been shown or not. It's certainly not pornographic. So, you know, I think that all of these things are things that can be discussed. And, and although these are mostly great classics on the, this list, we, we can certainly have a conversation about, you know, why did they include this on the list? Or is this in some way problematic. Some of them are appropriate for even small children. Some of them are appropriate for teenagers. But just to give you an idea of like the kind of content the, these films contain, don't assume that you can watch them with your your small kids, but don't be scared off by what we're saying here either. It, yeah, right. And, and it, Stephen Gray Dennis makes the point in his article, the article that you were referencing, Thomas, that, you know, some of the films that are included are not necessarily the most well-regarded or the best of the directors in question, but that, you know, ostensibly some of those movies were left off of the list because of questionable or, you know, otherwise inappropriate content. So I think that, you know, our listeners can rest pretty confident that film list put out by the Vatican, we're not going to be coming across anything, hopefully, that uh, is going to be morally objectionable. But yeah, so so we, we do want to get others involved. We want you, our listeners, to join the conversation. So Thomas, do you want to tell us about how that can happen? We'll be announcing each film ahead of time. The first film discussion will already be out simultaneously pretty much with this intro. And that'll be the, the movie Babette's Feast, which we're doing as our first film. And, you know, if you're listening to this intro, you should probably be able to go ahead and listen to this, listen to that discussion afterwards. But from that point onwards, we'll announce each film in advance. And and the reason we want to do that is to facilitate and hopefully an online discussion of the films by the listeners. So you can go and watch the film. We'll be doing an episode every two weeks. So that'll give you plenty of time to do that and engage in the discussion. And you can do that at Catholic Pod's Twitter account, but the best place to do it would be our recently created Facebook group, which is called CatholicCulture.org Podcasts Community, and that's at facebook.com slash groups slash Catholic Pods. So you can just go there and join that. And I will ask that if you do that, uh, which you should, if you want to participate in the film discussions, you should answer the questions that are asked when you join, just so that I'll know you're not just some random person and we can have people in the group who are actually involved with this. And if people start discussing the films online, you know, we hope to be able to incorporate some of their questions and comments and insights into our podcast discussion in the future as well. This podcast will be, you know, for the foreseeable future, focusing on the Vatican film list, especially, you know, there's 45 films on the list. And if we're going to be doing it at the schedule of about two a month, you know, it's going to take us a while to just get through that. So we'll probably focus on that almost exclusively. But we will occasionally be get, bringing you um, discussions of other things uh, in between if there's a film that that's newly released that is of relevance to the the overall area of our podcast, I think I think we'll be doing some episodes on those as well uh, from time to time. Right, just no Star Wars. 
Right. Well, I mean, it depends how, <laughs> you know, if maybe there will be no. a Star Wars it's miracle. It's dead to me. Maybe there will be. It's maybe dead there, to me, Thomas. Maybe, maybe there will be a Star Wars miracle. And I'm, I'm not saying it's not dead to me. I'm just saying have a little, have a little <laughs> eschatological. We, we are an Easter people. It is true. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's <laughs> what I'm getting at. So you can find Babette's Feast for rent on Amazon and iTunes for a few bucks. But you can also find it uh, for streaming on a streaming website called the Criterion Channel. And this gives us an opportunity to explain the title of the podcast, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast. So Criteria is is really, I mean, you can interpret it a number of different ways, I suppose. But the reason I picked that for the name is as a kind of reference to this film, I guess, publishing company called the Criterion Collection. And it's not because all of the films we're watching are in that collection, but it it was sort of like a, a reference to the, the caliber of film that we're dealing with. Because the Criterion Collection is this company that puts out basically these really amazing definitive editions of great classic films, whether Hollywood classics foreign films, indie films, silent, you know, old silent films, things like that. They've been around, I can't remember, maybe the late 80s, but certainly since the early 90s. And they are the the company, it happens, that, that brought us the DVD commentary, which of course is something that's kind of disappeared to a large extent due to the advent of online streaming. Um, you, you don't have director's commentaries on Netflix, obviously, but they've kept it up. And their packages typically have a really nice restored version of the, the film, sort of like the, the best edition you can get of it, with a lot of amazing extras, interviews, behind the scenes, film commentaries by, if not the director, then by you know a film scholar of repute. So anyway, they recently started, at the beginning of 2019, they started a streaming service called the Criterion Channel where you can get a lot of movies that are in their collection and and some that aren't. And the channel typically includes whatever special features would be found on the Criterion Blu-ray or DVD release. And as it happens, as of the recording of this intro in April 2020, about half, I think just under half of the films, the 45 films on the Vatican film list, are available for streaming right now on the Criterion channel. So that might not be, you can, most of them are also available for rent online, but that might not be a bad investment, just getting a, um, a subscription to that. I don't know the exact price, but it's, it's comparable to the other streaming services. And there are many great classics, certainly some, some moral trash on there, like with any streaming uh, service, but many great classics that are not on the Vatican film list as well, religious classics, as well as, as non-religious ones. So I think that's pretty much it. We just wanted to do this little episode to introduce the concept of the podcast, tell you a little bit about the Vatican film list and our our approach to uh, discussing these movies. So go ahead and uh, watch Babette's Feast when you get a chance and then listen to our podcast discussion. I think typically we'll be including spoilers just to facilitate an actual discussion. So it's best to have watched the film before listening to the episodes. And and that's one reason we're spacing them out is to give people maximal chance to do that. So thank you for listening and we hope you enjoy this journey with us. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And by the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do give it a subscription in uh, whatever your podcast app is, or you can listen on our website, catholicculture.org slash criteria. And there you can also find the show notes for each episode. So for example, in this, we'll link to the John Paul II address that we quoted from. We'll listen, to, we'll link to the actual list of films, to the Criterion channel, to the Stephen Gray Danis article we mentioned. And we'll be doing that sort of thing if there's any film resources for, for each film we discuss or any supplemental material that we want to direct people to, as well as the film itself. We'll be linking to those on the show notes. So you can you should be able to view those in your podcast app. But if you use an app that doesn't show the show notes, you can also go to the website again, catholicculture.org slash criteria. So thanks again, and also thank you to the great band, The Dusk Whales, for allowing us to use their music as intro and outro music for the podcast. That happens to be 
a band in which James's younger brother, Brian, is the keyboardist, actually, and one of my favorite bands. So thanks to the Dusk Whales for that. And actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and link to their website as well at the show notes. All right. Play us out, Dusk Whales. 